I must confess, I have a bit of a Warhammer blind spot when it comes to the Tyranids. I painted a few, but most of the range is a mystery to me. And to add even more to my shame, I actually own a whole bunch of them. These have been my pile of shame since basically at the very beginning. These are from when Nick and I used to flip armies on Daka Daka way back in the day, and I remember either purchasing or trading for a buddy of mine's fledgling Tyranid army. So I don't remember what's in here, let's crack it open and take a look. All right, we've got a bunch of Hormagants, Termagants, and a smattering of other things. I guess let's look at the other things. We have a P, like 20% of a fine cast Tyranid Zone Throp. We've got 75% of a Gargoyle. Um, ooh, a little bit more of that Zone Throp. Looks like, it looks like pretty much all of three Tyranid Warriors, which is great. I was hoping that I still had these because I really want to do a kill team. And I'm thinking, oops, all Warriors is in my future. And his tail's broken. Ah, I know why. I remember uh, I used a candle to try to melt their tails so I could repose them, and uh, I melted them a fair bit. We've got one Gene Stealer from a Space Hulk. All right, and I have 19 Hormagots in various stages of disarray. I think I have enough bits to properly finish these guys. And then I have 11 Termagants, and some of these are pretty well broken. So really, I think I have 10. This guy is definitely missing Wow, most everything. I must have stepped on him. But that's cool, so there's plenty enough here for a kill team. It's good to know. Now this bag, this is where the fun begins. So in this bag, there's about, one, two, three, a billion of these spine fists. Anybody who's built a Termagants knows that you end up with tons and tons and tons of spine fists, because they each, each, each of them needs two, and the kit comes with 12 or 20. I think it comes with 12. And then we've got what looks like two rogue trader pyrovores. Hopefully they're all together. Yes, so I have two complete rogue trader pyrovores. I have one nearly complete fifth edition Tyranid Hive Guard back when they were made of white metal, and unfortunately I'm missing one of the arms. So, a little bit of a bummer there. Ah, it looks like one more piece of the Zonethrope. I have a tail from probably a Tyranid Ravager, a Hive Tyrant's arm, and this. And this is something kind of cool. This model is a Tyranid Hive Guard from Warhammer's 3rd edition. When 40k was in a really fun place, where the artwork of the minis was incredibly badass. I mean, just look at this codex cover. It's just dripping with grim dark awesomeness. Dark colors, an evil red sun in the back, everything looks sharp and is glistening in a very menacing way. But once you crack it open and look at the model pictures of what Tyranid models looked like at this time, well... In researching this Hive Guard mini, I reread the codex from 2001, and you will get some crazy tonal whiplash flipping through the codexes from this time period. The juxtaposition is funny, but really there's a reason for this, and that reason was the lingering effects of Rogue Trader and 2nd Edition. The Tyranids have existed in 40k since the very beginning, and they looked really different to how we know them today. And this book existed in that in-between stage, as Games Workshop was replacing their OG pewter bugs with their big, bright, eye-catching candy colors and substituting them with sleek, sexy plastic kits that better matched the grim dark aesthetic that 40k was cultivating. I got my first introduction to the Tyranids with the 5th edition codex, and if I had never taken the time to look backwards through the ages, I never would have known that any of this heavy pewter stuff ever existed. You see, Rogue Trader was a wild time, with such kits as the swashbuckling Tyranid Warriors, with hips that don't lie and an upright posture we can all aspire to have one day. A clear product of their time, and have since gone the way of the Dodo, to be replaced with the modern Tyranid Warriors, with more weapon options in this one kit than the entire Necron range. 
Seriously, every guy has 8 weapon options and 2 war gear options. We also had the original Tyranid Carnifex, known as the Screamer Killer, and the name says it all. It was screaming and it was killing, and it looked like it should be fighting the Ninja Turtles more than devouring worlds. The new model looks much more like a proper living tank, but I appreciate that they are still screaming. A nice subtle nod to where it all began. And finally, the old Hive Tyrant, and honestly, I don't have any problems with it. Sure, it's old, but it actually looks basically the exact same as the modern one. It's all there, the tail with a little mouth on it, the extra long fleshy gun, the shoulder mounted smokestacks, the tentacle whip and bone swords, the hooves. Even the posture and proportions are basically the same. The new version, which is one of my favorite minis Games Workshop makes, is the same model just with modern day textures and details. Sometimes lightning strikes, and this model really is what all modern Tyranids are based off of. Pretty cool. Corporate needs to find the difference between this picture and this picture. They're the same picture. So that brings us to this little honey, the old metal Tyranid Hive Guard. This guy looks... Well, it looks really bad. To me, it lacks any real wow factor or charm. It's not very detailed, the shield looks derpy, and is way too small to require two hands to operate it. It's just... bad. And I think that's why this has remained in the deep dark recesses of my bits drawer for years. I just don't feel much of anything toward this model. But maybe, that's not where the story has to end. Perhaps if I sit down and spend a few quality hours with this mini, I can reinvent it into something cool. Inside this derpy mini, there is perhaps a glimmer of something, a what if, and I want to give it a try. I don't know if I can salvage it, but I think it's worth a shot, and even if I fail, I think it'll be worth the effort. I do to this guy to turn him from dopey to dope? Well, I have a few ideas, but one thing I'm kind of trapped with is his basic pose and posture. His head is attached to his torso and I really don't want to grind it off, so I'm kind of stuck there. But one thing I do have access to is his arms. I think one big thing I'm going to try to do is to cut his shield in half. That way it'll be two small shields that can form into one big one, as opposed to always stuck as one big one. Another thing that I'm going to try to do is take this Ravener tail I have, and attach it onto his little stump. I think this will help thicken him up and make him not look so off balance. Then I can repose the other arms and hopefully that'll give me a great base to play with when it comes time to painting. Oh, and I want to try to give him a huge horn on his head. Let's get to work. I tore him apart and as always the case with these metal models, it didn't take too much effort. If you're squeamish, look away now as I massacre this 40 millimeter base. I cleaned all the parts with some files and sanding sticks, and I used a Dremel tool on the more egregious parts, like his hooves. Well, I just got really lucky. When I was cleaning this guy up, the legs fell off. So that's awesome, it's gonna give me a lot more freedom when it comes to posing. I thought this guy had been super glued for the past 20 years, those legs are gonna be stuck exactly like that until the sun eats the earth, but they just fell off, so awesome. Now it was time to kit bash. Definitely more of a production when it comes to metal models. I ground away the tail to make it thinner, then I drilled a hole the same size as my pin, inserted the pin, clipped it off, then got to work on his stump. I clipped off his little lump of a tail, then drilled a hole to receive the peg. I could have just super glued the tail, but it would have certainly fallen right off. Pinning it will make it much stronger. Then I stuck some green stuff into the leg holes and reposed the legs. I made some marks on the base where the legs were going to go so I could insert the pins. Then it was just a matter of poking and prodding the torso until it was the pose I wanted. But you know what's great without any poking and prodding? That's right, our Patreon. Over there we have lots of high quality terrain STLs available and it is the best way to help support us making videos. In addition to great grim dark terrain, you also gain access to one exclusive video a week, some behind the scenes, voting on models I paint live here on YouTube, a live hobby hangout every week, and more. Another great way to support us is by checking out our merch. You can follow the link in the description below to our shirts and sweatshirts with some fun, hobby related designs. Now with that said, it's time to get horny. I didn't forget about my horn idea. I glued on a hive tyrant finger which made a pretty good horn. Next it was the part I was procrastinating on the most, cutting the shield in half. This took a very long time, and my dremel tool removed a lot of metal. I also used my hobby nippers to gouge at the thick metal until it finally gave away. Once it was in half, I sanded the ragged cuts I made smooth. Now that this one shield two arm situation was two shields two arms, I had tons of freedom when it came to posing. No more awkwardly holding the shield out in front for this chappie. It can be dynamic. 
I stuck on his whip arm and I carefully sliced the contact points on the whip so that I could repose them how I wanted. This was a major improvement over the original. So I don't have a Tyranid army and I don't really plan on starting one. So that leaves me with the question of what to do with this one hive guard. Well, I have an idea. I will make him a lone survivor, a lost Tyranid trapped on a planet. He will become a legend, a cryptid terrorizing some poor population. And there is some precedent for something like this. Although most Tyranid organisms only live a very short time, only long enough to serve their purpose, whether it's swarming a bastion or demolishing a Lehman Rust tank, the more sophisticated biomorphs can be capable of living for years, if not practically immortal. The Gene Stealers are one such biomorph in the Tyranid species that can live for hundreds of years and are often found in small pockets or sometimes large ones all over the galaxy. So it's quite possible that a hive guard trapped aboard a fleeing spaceship could become marooned, far from its original hive fleets. For the base, I did a classic earthy ground. I super glued on some cork, attaching pebbles to a layer of wood glue, and then finishing it off with some fine grain sand. A good, quick, classic basing scheme. Now that the base is done, I can start to think about painting. Also, pro tip, whenever I apply glue, I always use these old brushes and I clean them out in my water cup. And make sure to clean out your water cup and change your water before you start painting. I have lost many a good brush to gluey water. I prepared for painting. I like painting on a pane of glass. It makes cleanup easy. I hosed down the model with some Steinle Res Black Primer, but a rattle can would have honestly been better. More aggressive, robust paint. Then I zenithaled the mini from above using some white primer. Then it was base coat time. So I've been sitting here way too long with my zenithaled mini trying to figure out what color scheme I want to go with. And it's hard, but I think, I think I'm gonna go with blue and orange. Those aren't colors I use a lot, and I think they'll look cool, right? Well, yeah, yeah, blue and orange. That's what we're going with, blue and orange. I threw these colors into my airbrush, super watered down, a dark blue and a red. This will be a base to build my orange off of. And two thin coats is true for the airbrush too, really, especially with the tiny nozzle like the 1.5 millimeter size I'm using. With this thin paint, I was able to take advantage of my Zenithal Prime by spraying lightly enough that the undercoat was shining through. Now that he's looking like a very weird Spider-Man, you might think he looks terrible, but it's just that he doesn't look good yet. I threw some black and white inks into my airbrush and made my shadows darker and added highlights of white to the raised parts of his skin and armor. This will add in tons of value and help me pick my areas of interest. The brightest white spots will draw the most attention. Now that the bug has lots more value with black and white present on the mini, I put more inks into my airbrush in orange and blue. I glazed these over top of the white I just applied and this did a great job of tinting and gave me some buttery smooth blends, some the actual color of butter. Now I was a little unhappy with my blue ink, so I decided to spice it up with some light blue acrylic paint through the airbrush. Now he was truly base coated. Then I went in with a brush and did some highlights. These were pretty small. I did most of the work with the airbrush, so now it's just some finishing touches. On the carapace, I thinned down some orange paint and took a brush with long bristles and made many small straight lines to give the armor some texture that wasn't there before. I went over these orange lines with yellow lines to make them even more vibrant. So the model's looking pretty good. I'm reasonably happy with my color choices, but I feel like it could use a little something. And I'd love to try some drastic steps on this, but it's hard to do those on the model I've just spent five hours on. So I made myself this. This is a swatch with the colors I already have on the model. Now I can try things out on this instead of having to risk the paint I have already done. I tried a teal ink, but that overpowered my colors. Then I tried a yellow, but this didn't do much of anything to my colors. Then I tried a brown, which turned everything brown, and finally a green, which was the most interesting one yet, but still not perfect. After some more tries, the winner was magenta. This worked really well, where it darkened and warmed the blue, and it turned the orange back into red. I threw this into my airbrush and started to selectively spray it onto the model, into the recess of his armor and the joints of his arms. This was a super fun step, as it worked over all of the painting I had already done, and instead of covering it up, it enhanced them. I'm so glad I did that. I know it's part of the Tyranid's thing to have a crazy difference in color to give the model some contrast, but for me, it was kind of just looking like I had taken the arms off my blue G.I. Joe and put them onto my red G.I. Joe. Now with the same magenta tones existing in the orange and the blue, it makes it look like it's a lot more done on purpose. And it kind of justifies the crazy color scheme. Now with the model done, it was time to finish off that base. And to tell you all about that base, about that base, I applied a watery brown. Then I applied a watery black to the flat brown. Then I took a tan paint and began dry brushing this over everything. Then finishing it off with a watery green to make the ground look like it had a little life to it. Then the only thing left to do was to paint the rim of the base black. 
The model is now done, and I think it turned out pretty sharp. But let's take a look at what the model could have looked like if I had kept the building and paint job more contemporary to the time period it was made in. Awkward pose, bright colors, with a high contrast in a cartoony manner. This is why I didn't initially like the model, but now, compare that to what I was able to pull off. What began as a lump of pewter about 20 years ago has now blossomed into a pretty badass monster. The separated shield now looks like it could be a pair of effective close combat weapons, good for bashing away at the enemy while still leaving the door open to forming it back together for maximum protection. And similarly, the whip arm now cut up and reposed into a dangerous looking flurry of razor sharp pincing claws. The long meaty tail and newly acquired wide stance make this creature look much more balanced and menacing, able to spring into action instead of just march. I really like the new look of the Hive Guard, but now I think three of these flanking a Hive Tyrant would actually look pretty dope. I'm kinda loving this model, which is kinda hilarious because I seem to remember myself saying something like, I just don't feel much of anything toward this model. Now, I think it's cool. I don't know if I would want more of these as it took about the same amount of time to build it as to paint it, and it wasn't a quick paint job, but I'm really happy about being this happy about a model I previously didn't like. This model is old, but it's not even that old. It's third edition old, not rogue trader old. I would love to get my hands on something tyrannid in a rogue trader era flavor. Maybe one day a man can dream. But I now have the fifth painted tyrannid in my collection, so he needs a name. I can call him the Red Terror. No wait, that's already, that's already a thing. The Orange Dread. Nah, that's not very good either. The Hexapetal Horror. No. Let me know in the comments what is the name the terrified locals have given to this abomination that stalks them from the shadows. Thank you for watching this video all the way till the end, and because of that, I have a special offer for you. Remember those two third edition Tyranid Biovores? Well, if you are a subscriber, like the video and leave a comment, we will send them to you. I don't have a use for them, so hopefully we can find them a new home, so make sure that you subscribe, like the video, and leave a comment saying, Unleash the Spores. After seven days, we'll pick someone at random to send them to. Good luck, and thanks for watching.